Greetings, folks. My name is Dustin Cormier. This is How to Rock Spirit. We're going to be continuing Yoga, the Science of the Soul by Osho, which is, of course, Osho's translation of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. In our last episode, we began Chapter 1. Uh, now, this is the second third of that first chapter. In our next episode, we're going to finish chapter one. In the last episode, we mentioned that Patanjali is a rigorous mathematician in regard to the science of the soul. And he doesn't leave a single word, uh, he doesn't say a single word superfluously. And he's going to re remind us of this again. So, <clears throat> Osho now. Osho has been introducing the text. Now he's going to come into the first sutra. The first sutra reads, Now, the discipline of yoga. Each and every word has to be understood, Osho tells us, because Patanjali will not use a single superfluous word. Now, the discipline of yoga. First, try to understand the word now. This now indicates towards the state of mind I was just telling you about. No past, no present, no future. If you are disillusioned, if you are hopeless, if you have completely become aware of the futility of all desires, if you see your life as meaningless, if whatever you've been doing up to now has simply fallen dead, nothing remains in the future. You are in absolute despair, what Kierkegaard calls anguish. If you are in anguish, suffering, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go, not knowing to whom to look, just on the verge of madness or suicide and de or death, and your whole pattern of life suddenly has become futile. If this moment has come, Patan Patanjali says, now the discipline of yoga. Only now can you understand the science of yoga and the discipline of yoga. If that moment has not come, you can go on studying yoga you can become a great scholar, but you will not be a yogi. You can write theses about it. You can give discourses on it, but you will not be a yogi. The moment has not come for you. Intellectually, you can become interested. Through your mind, you can be related to yoga. But yoga is nothing if it is not a discipline. Yoga is not a shastra. It's not a scripture. It is a discipline. It is something you have to do. It is not a curiosity. It is not philosophical speculation. It is deeper than that. It is a question of life and death. If the moment has come where you feel that all directions have become confused, all roads have disappeared, the future is dark and every desire has become bitter, and through every desire you have known only disappointment, all movement into hopes and dreams have ceased, in this case, now the discipline of yoga. This now may not have come. I can go on talking about yoga, but you will not listen. You can listen only if the moment is present in you. Are you really dissatisfied? Everybody will say yes, but that dissatisfaction is not real. You are dissatisfied with this. You may be dissatisfied with that. But you are not totally dissatisfied. 
you are still hoping. You are dissatisfied because of your past hopes, but for the future, you are still hoping. Your dissatisfaction is not total. You are still hankering for some satisfaction somewhere, for some gratification somewhere. Sometimes you feel hopeless, but that hopelessness is not true. You feel hopeless because certain hopes have not been achieved. Certain hopes have fallen. But hoping is still there. Hoping has not fallen. You will still hope. You are dissatisfied with this hope, that hope. But you are not dissatisfied with hope as such. If you are disappointed with hope as such, then the moment has come and you can enter yoga. Then this entry will not be entering into a mental speculative phenomenon. This entry will be an entry into a discipline. What is discipline? Discipline means creating an order within you. As you are, you are a chaos. As you are, you are totally disorderly. George Gurdjieff used to say, and Gurdjieff is in many ways like Patanjali. He was again trying to make the core of religion a science. Gurdjieff says that you are not one, you are a crowd. Not even when you say, I, is there any I. There are many I's in you, many egos. In the morning, one I. In the afternoon, another I. In the evening, a third I. But you never become aware of this mess because of who, who will become aware of it? There is no center that can become aware. To say that yoga is discipline means yoga wants to create a crystallized center in you. As you are, you are a crowd. And a crowd has many phenomena. One is that you cannot believe a crowd. Gurdjieff used to say that man cannot promise. Who will promise? You are not there. If you promise, who will fulfill the promise? Next morning, the one who promised is no more. A new person. People come to me and they say, now I will take a vow. I promise to do this. I tell them, think twice before you promise something. Are you confident that the next moment, the one who promised will be there? You decide to get up early in the morning, starting tomorrow, at 4 o'clock. But at 4 o'clock, somebody in you says, Don't bother. It is so cold outside. And why are you in such a hurry? We can do it tomorrow. And you fall asleep again. When you get up, you repent. And you think, This is not good. I should have done it. You decide again, Tomorrow, tomorrow I will do it. And the same thing is going to happen tomorrow, because at four in the morning, the one who promised is no longer there. Somebody else is in the chair. You are a rotary club. The chairman goes on changing. Every member becomes a rotary chairman. Every moment, someone else is the master. Gurdjieff used to say, this is the chief characteristic of man that he cannot promise. You cannot fulfill a promise. You can go on giving promises, and you know well that you cannot fulfill them. It is because you are not one. You are a disorder, a chaos. Hence, Patanjali says, now the discipline of yoga no past, 
no present, no future. If your life has become an absolute misery, if you have realized that whatsoever you do creates hell, then the moment has come. This moment can change your dimension, your direction of being. Up until now, you have lived as chaos, a crowd. Yoga means that now you have to be a harmony. You have to become one. Crystallization is needed. Center is needed. And unless you attain a center, all that you do is meaningless and useless. It is wasting life and time. A center is the first necessity, and only a person who has a center can be blissful. Everybody asks for blissfulness, but you cannot ask for it. You have to earn it. Everybody hankers for a blissful state of being. But only a center can be blissful. A crowd cannot be blissful. A crowd has no self. Who is going to be blissful? Bliss means absolute silence. And silence is possible only when there is harmony. When all the discordant fragments have become one. When there is no crowd but one. When you are alone in the house and nobody else is there, you will be blissful. Right now, everybody else is in your house. You are not there. Only guests are there. The host is always absent, and only the host can be blissful. This centering, Patanjali calls discipline, Anushasanam. The word discipline is beautiful. It comes from the same root as the word disciple. Discipline means the capacity to learn, the capacity to know. But you cannot know, you cannot learn, unless you have attained the capacity to be. A man once came to Buddha, and he said he must, have been, he must have been a social reformer, a revolutionary. And he said to Buddha, the world is in misery. I agree with you. But Buddha never said that the world is in misery. Buddha says you are the misery, not the world. Life is misery not the world. Man is misery, not the world. Mind is misery, not the world. But that revolutionary said, the world is in misery. I agree with you. Now tell me, what can I do? I have a deep compassion and I want to serve humanity. Service must have been this guy's motto. Buddha looked at him and remained silent. Buddha's disciple, Ananda, said, <clears throat> Sorry, Buddha's disciple, Ananda, looked at the Buddha and said, This man seems to be sincere. Guide him, Gautama, why are you silent? Then Buddha said to the revolutionary, You want to serve the world, but where are you? I don't see anyone inside. I look in you and there is no one. You don't have any center. And unless you are centered, whatsoever you do will create more mischief. All of your social reformers, your revolutionaries, your leaders, they are the great mischief mongers. The world would be better if there were no leaders but they cannot help themselves. They must do something because the world is in misery. 
and they are not centered. So whatever they do, they just create more misery. Just, just compassion will not help. Just service will not help. Compassion that flows through a centered being is something totally different. Compassion coming through a crowd is mischief. That compassion is poison. Osho remarks, now the discipline of yoga. Discipline means the capacity to be the capacity to know, the capacity to learn. We must understand these three things, to know, to be, and to learn. The capacity to be. All the yoga postures are not really concerned with the body. They are concerned with the capacity to be. Patanjali says, if you can sit silently without moving your body for a few hours, you are growing in the capacity to be. Why do you move? You cannot sit without moving even for a few seconds. Your body starts moving. Somewhere you feel itching. The legs go dead. Many things start happening. These are just excuses for you to move. You are not a master. You cannot say to the body, now for one hour I will not move. The body will revolt immediately. Immediately it will force you to move, to do something. And it will give reasons. You have to move because an insect is biting you. You may not even find the insect when you look. You are not a being. You are a trembling, a continuous, hectic activity. Patanjali's asanas, the postures, are concerned not really with any kind of physiological training, but an inner training of being. Just to be, without doing anything, without any movement, without any activity, just remain. Excuse me. That remaining will help centering. If you can remain in one posture, the body will become a servant. It will follow you. And the more the body follows you, the greater being what you will have within you, a stronger being within you. And remember, if the body is not moving, your mind cannot move, because mind and body are not two things. They are two poles of one phenomenon. You are not body and mind. You are body-mind. Your personality is psychosomatic, body-mind both. The mind is the subtlest part of the body. Or you can say the reverse, that the body is the grossest part of the mind. So whatever happens in the body, happens in the mind, and vice versa. Whatever happens in the mind, happens in the body. If the body is non-moving and you can attain a posture, if you can say to the body, keep quiet, the mind will remain silent. Really, the mind starts moving and tries to move the body because if the body moves, then the mind can move. In a non-moving body, the mind cannot move. It needs a moving body. If the body is non-moving, the mind is non-moving. You are centered. This non-moving posture is not just a physical, physiological training. 
It is to create a situation in which centering can happen, in which you can become disciplined. When you are, when you have become centered, when you know what it means to be, then you can learn. Because then you will be humble. Then you can surrender. Then no false ego will cling to you. Because once centered, you know all egos are false. Then you can bow down. Then a disciple is born. A disciple means a seeker who is not a crowd who is trying to be centered and crystallized, at least trying, making efforts, sincere efforts, to become individual, to feel his being, to become his own master. All discipline of yoga is an effort to make you a master of yourself. As you are, you are just a slave of many, many desires. Many, many masters are there, and you are just a slave, pulled in many directions. Now, the discipline of yoga. Yoga is discipline. It is an effort on your part to change yourself. Many other things have to be understood. Yoga is not a therapy. In the West, many psychological therapies are prevalent now, and many Western psychologists think that yoga is also a therapy. It is not. It is a discipline. And what is the difference? This is the difference. A therapy is needed if you are ill. A therapy is needed if you are diseased. A therapy is needed if you are pathological. A discipline is needed even when you are healthy. Really, a discipline can help only when you are healthy. It is not for pathological cases. Yoga is for those who are completely healthy as far as medical science is concerned. They are normal. They are not schizophrenic. They are not mad. They are not neurotic. They are normal people, healthy people with no particular pathology. Still, they become aware that whatever is called normality is futile. Whatever is called health is of no use. Something more is needed. Something greater is needed. Something more whole is needed. Therapies are for ill people. Therapies can help you to come to yoga. But yoga is not a therapy. Yoga is for a higher order of health, a different order of health, a different type of being and wholeness. Therapy can, at the most, make you adjusted. Freud says we cannot do more. We can make you an adjusted, normal member of the society. But if the society itself is pathological, then... And of course, society is pathological. The society itself is ill. A therapy can make you normal in the sense that you are adjusted to the society, but the society itself is ill. So sometimes it happens that in an ill society, a healthy person is thought to be ill. A Jesus is thought to be ill, and every effort is done to make him adjusted. And when it is found that he is a hopeless case, then he is crucified. When it is found that nothing can be done, that this man is incurable, 
then he is crucified. The society is itself ill because society is nothing but your collective. If all the members are ill, the society is ill, and every member has to be adjusted to it. Yoga is not therapy at its root. Yoga is not trying in any way to make you adjusted to the society. If you want to define yoga in terms of adjustment, then it is not an adjustment with the society, but an adjustment with existence itself. It is an adjustment with the whole. So it might happen that a perfect yogi could appear mad to you. He may look out of his senses, out of his mind, because now he is in touch with a higher mind, a higher order of things. He is in touch with the universal mind. It has always happened so. A Buddha, a Jesus, a Krishna, they always look somehow eccentric. They don't seem to belong to us. They seem to be outsiders. That's why we call them avatars, outsiders. It is as if they have come from some other planet. They don't seem to belong to us. They may be higher, they may be good, they may be divine, but they don't belong to us. They come from somewhere else. They are not part and parcel of humankind. The feeling has persisted that they are outsiders. They are not. They are the real insiders because they have touched the innermost core of existence. But to us, they appear to be outsiders. Now, the discipline of yoga. That's where we'll leave off today, folks. Catch us on the next episode. We're going to finish off chapter one and finally go through the beginnings of the rest of chapter one of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras as translated by Osho. Thanks so much for hanging out with me, folks. I'll see you guys on the next one.